microphones here in the room. Um, please just turn the microphones off, please raise your hand and make yourself known to me if possible. Uh, I'll, I'll try and catch you. Okay, Thomas, over to you, thank you. Okay, great. Yes, so just briefly to end here. Uh, so I got this, so in R it is possible interact to create these interactive plots so that you can see, you know, this is the, um, it's a little, a little flaky because it's, it's in uh, X quartz, but it, it's possible to do this as an interactive plot. Okay. Um, so now we can talk about instrumental variables. Um, and I have to apologize in advance uh, because I'm not gonna get through all of the uh, slides that I've got here, um, but uh, I'll show you uh, enough, hopefully to get you interested. And then um, uh, at least one of my collaborators um, uh, is currently in Berkeley. So if you have more questions, you can ask him about the, about the parts that I'm probably gonna skip. Um, and yeah, so um, another point I want to make here about potential outcomes is the fact that um, these, the potential outcome framework, not necessarily the things I'm showing, but the potential outcome framework as a way of thinking about causal problems is, is very extensively used. Um, you know, th there are certain popular books that you can read that may you know, give you the impression that in statistics, nobody has been, uh, or in applied data analysis, nobody has been thinking about things causally. And that's really not, not the case. It's just that uh, often those models have been formulated with potential outcomes. And so part of the purpose of these lectures is to sort of uh, provide a bridge uh, between the graphical way of doing things, uh, which has a lot of strengths and the potential outcome framework, which also has a lot of strengths. They're basically two different languages um, and you know they have their strengths and weaknesses, but they complement one another. Okay, this is what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna very briefly uh, review some points relating to what I just showed you. I'm gonna talk about the instrumental variable model and I'll motivate that by non-compliance. And I want, we'll think about that in terms of combining observational studies, which will build on what we just did previously. Um, and that will lead to bounds on the average causal effect and tests of the uh, IV instrumental variable model. And then what I won't have time to go all the way through is um, describing uh, approaches to statistical inference. I probably will um, <coughs> have time to tell you a little bit about uh, Bayesian approaches. I'll, um, I'll, I'll sort of tell you a naive way to do Bayesian inference, and then I'll tell you a, a, a way that is um, that avoids the problems that naive approach uh, has. And I, yeah, I may just be able to touch on frequentist approaches, but probably lunchtime will be calling. So I, I should also give you some caveats here, especially if you're a, a coming from econometrics, or um, I, I should say. Um, the approach I'm describing here, this is like a question that got asked uh, at last session. The approach I'm describing will make minimal assumptions and it will be valid, you know, even if the instrument is, is weak, if you've heard of what that is. If you don't know what it is, don't worry. Um, but it will only consider binary treatment and outcome, um, although uh, there are some extensions. And it, it will also obtain bounds, not point identification. Um, so I just want to let you know so full disclosure here, there's a huge literature on instrumental variables. And here I'm just focusing on categorical uh, treatment and, and, and outcome. So, you know, this is partly because it's, I think it's easy to understand, in some ways easy to understand and it links to the things that I've described um, in the first session. And it will also in some ways set things up for what we're gonna talk about this afternoon. But um, there is, you know, um, there's a lot more, very, very large amount of instrumental variable approaches out there. Okay, so summary so far, we had a randomized study, okay, and I uh, expressed it to you in terms of these uh, independences, and um, if you were sort of paying attention um, the last two days, you'll have seen the sort of implicitly uh, um, where we have uh, a cause and an outcome, and we have no confounding. This is how it's represented in the graphical framework, the sort of convention that if I'm not, if I'm not explicitly including a hidden variable, then it's sort of presuppose that one is not there. Whereas an observational study where we have confounding would correspond to the graph on the right, where you know one of these independences doesn't hold. And we saw that um, uh, in the randomized study, the, uh, the margins of the potential outcomes were identified. The joint was a 1D set. We saw that in the 
randomized uh, observational study, um, the margins were not identified. The joint was a 3D set. Over here, the AC was identified. Here we had bounds of length one. Okay, on to instrumental variables. So just to sort of give you a, a, a to provide a provocative example to think about and to provide some motivation. Um, you know, if you've taken a, a, an intro statistics course, um, often it's presented that, well, you know, from randomized experiments, we can draw causal conclusions. And then depending on which course you took, uh, you're either told that it was impossible from observational studies, or maybe you were told it, we have to be careful, or, you know, it depends exactly. But, um, but you might have wondered to yourself, well, wait a second, you know, is this really a hard and sharp dichotomy between randomized experiment and an observational study? You can sort of think about, well, you know, could I imagine, could there be something that was sort of somewhere between a randomized experiment and, a, and a, a, an observational study? Is this maybe, uh, you know, is, is there something which, which, you know, for example, what happens when we do a randomized experiment and things don't go quite as we hoped? So here's an example. There's a lot of text on this page. You don't need to read all of it, um, but it's, it's sort of there uh, to, to provide the uh, gritty realism. Um, uh, so this is going back to a, um, a this is an announcement of, a, of a, the result of a drug trial. It's in the Lancet. Um, and um, really the thing, so the, the conclusion was that uh, this drug, oral gancyclovir, has failed to prevent symptomatic uh, cytomegalovirus infections in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And it says, you know, this seems to contradict those of a similar trial, indicating that it did reduce this disease. Um, so that study was conducted, you know, uh, in parallel and earlier to the the, uh, the the study that's being reported here. Then there are details about exactly how the study was conducted. 662 volunteers were in the treatment group and 332 to placebo. And then this is a sort of the summary. Oral gancyclovir did not prevent symptomatic CMV disease to a clinically or statistically significant degree. The NIAID concluded in its announcement. Also, also the drug caused significantly more adverse effects than did placebo. Okay, so this is the, this is a summary. It has to be said it's being published to the Lancet. So, you know, this may say more about scientific journalism than what I'm about to show you, but this is what the Lancet didn't say. The data analysis here used an intention to treat method. Okay, and what does that mean? The intention to treat method means that it examines the difference between those asked to take treatment versus those asked to take placebo. And they were double blind, but, uh, regardless of what they actually took. And that becomes very relevant in this uh, study because you know, there were, um, this, this was a point where there were treatments being worked out you know, where there weren't uh, um, uh, uh, successful AIDS treatments available. So there were a lot of ethical issues about how people being in the control arm. And so after the CPCRA study began, the one that I showed you the reports of, the results for a different study involving 725 subjects showed a 49% decrease in the number of uh, clinical CMB infections in the group receiving this, this drug. Consequently, for ethical reasons, the CPCRA allowed the subjects in its placebo arm to take oral gancyclovir. Intention to treat analysis ignored this fact and the Lancet did not mention this problem. Okay. So hence the study that's being reported compares the effect of asking people to take the drug versus the placebo, but then giving everyone the drug anyway. So it's not very surprising under those circumstances that it doesn't, uh, the intention to treat analysis here doesn't demonstrate an effect of the drug, because if, if you sort of, we look at the intention to treat versus intention to give placebo, but then ultimately we don't, go all the way through on our intention and we give everyone the drug, then it's not very surprising. We're not gonna see a difference between the treatment and the control arm. So of course, you know, uh, the, the film version of things is never quite as, uh, it, it's always a little bit uh, uh, um, simpler than what really happened. You know, in fact, the people in the control arm only got two months of gancyclovir, whereas they got nine months in the treatment arm. But still, hopefully the key thing I want you to, to take away from here is, we can do a randomized study and things can go badly wrong. Okay, so we can have a randomized study where um, people do not comply with their treatment. So it's not that I'm gonna give you any magical way of, of, uh, of sort of fixing this problem, 
but I'm, it's to motivate um, thinking about non-compliance. So we're now going to think about a setting where patients are assigned to treatment or control, that's randomized, but then we then observe whether or not the patient takes more than a certain amount of a drug, and we then have the patient's health outcome. So for example, you know, we might be giving a patient a set of pills, and that's you know, double blind and randomized, but then maybe the patient isn't taking all the pills that we're asking them to take. And, and for certain settings, people get sufficiently worried about this that they, um, you know, they, they build uh, pill bottles that sort of record when, they're, when the pills are being taken out so that you can, you can track you know, the extent to which people are doing what they're being asked to do. So here is a, a stylized data set. I'll say in a moment why it's stylized, but this is a cholestyramine trial. This is one that Pearl considers. So we've now got you know, these three binary variables. Z is the arm that people are assigned to. X is whether, uh, whether or not they took more than a certain amount of the drug. And then Y is the final outcome. And then these, this is the data that's observed. Um, and these two zeros here uh, are in red because this was an experimental drug. So there was no way that people in the control arm could get access, could take the drug at all. So anyone that was in the control arm was not gonna have a one here. They're all gonna have a, a zero. So, that, so these entries are automatically zero. But then in the treatment arm, this drug you know, was, for, uh, uh, is to, was to, to reduce cholesterol. And um, it also had some side effects. I think it uh, gave people gas. I think it may have been that they even added that so that people got a certain amount of gas even in the control arm. But, but anyway, the, the, uh, um, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the basic point is that not everyone that was asked to take the treatment ended up uh, taking it. So I have to give a caveat here, which is that compliance was actually measured as a continuous uh, variable. Um, it was dichotomized by Pearl. I'm not necessarily arguing that that's justified, but it's useful to just have a, a simple data set to think about. There are other examples I can give you where compliance definitely is binary. Um, we may even get to one of those. Okay, so the key thing here is we did the experiment, we randomly assigned people to be in the treatment group versus the control group, but not everybody did what they were asked to do, but we have a measurement of whether or not they did what they were asked to do. And uh, we, what we would like to do is to recover, we'd like to recover what we would have seen had we done an experiment with perfect compliance. Okay? So had we been, you know, somehow able to, um, uh, I don't know, um, make sure that, uh, that everyone was taking their, uh, the, 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 the drug, um, uh, you know, who was in the treatment done. So here's an idea. You could say to yourself, okay, well, that's a pity. People didn't do what we asked them to do, but maybe we could think about this as just two observational studies. So here's our first observational study and here's our second observational study. So we could think about this randomization as essentially just randomly assigning people to participate in one of two observational studies and then, you know, what, what differs between the two studies is, is um, uh, how likely people are to take the drug in those two observational studies. So, in, in the, you know, in, the, in, this, in this observational study, everybody's certain to take control because, you know, this was the control arm. So nobody in this observational study is actually getting treatment at all. That's we've got these zeros. But then here, here in the, um, in the treatment arm, you know, some people are, are, are taking treatment, some people are taking control. Okay, so we just went through, if you were here for the first lecture this morning, then you know we just did a very careful analysis that allowed us to work out what were the potential, what were the possible distributions relating um, uh, treatment and outcome from an observational study. So now we've got two observational studies, so we could look at them, look at both of them, Okay, so this is what we would get from the z equals zero arm. We, we actually, in, here things become degenerate because right, uh, it was an observational study, but it was a very boring observational study where everybody got control, right? It was an observational study where nobody chose to take treatment. So we end up just, with, so it's just like, uh, we just end up with this, this two-dimensional plane. The other, the, the treatment arm, right? Some people are choosing to take treatment, some people are choosing to take control. So we end up with this polytope, uh, rhombic dodecahedron. But 
people are randomly assigned to participating in these two different ob observational studies. So therefore, um, uh, uh, we, it's, you know, these, these are both, it's reasonable to think that these uh, proportions help hurt always recover, never recover the same uh, in the two arms. Also, because we're supposing here that which observational study people are put into doesn't um, change the way that the drug affects them. Okay? So in particular, we're supposing, for example, that the people up here, uh, the, the people up here who, who are assigned to, um, who, who are assigned to this arm, where, this study where they can only take control, they only get the, the, the control, they have no way to take the active treatment. The way they respond is the same as the way that, uh, um, that the people here uh, respond to um, control. So in particular, we're sort of ruling out the possibility that the people that down here get some kind of frisson of, of, of rebellion because they, they, you know, they were asked to take the treatment, but they don't take the treatment. So we're supposing, you know, you could imagine a world where the people down here have some sort of a massive adrenaline rush from defying authority that the people up here don't have. We're supposing that's not the case, and I'll formalize that shortly. So we're supposing that how the people respond to control or treatment if they were to receive it is the same in these two studies, but we've got these two observational studies. So you know, people are selecting for themselves in these two studies whether or not they take treatment or not. So under those circumstances, we could then we could then take the intersection of these two. Okay, so we could then we could, in the same way that we did the intersection of the two planes in the where we had the two arms from the uh, from the randomized study. Here now we're combining the two observational studies. We're combining the z equals one information and the z equals zero information. When we take the intersection of those two, we get this nice little uh, shape down here, which uh, it, it looks as if it might be a rectangle, but it's actually a little hexagon. Okay. So why is that interesting? That's interesting because now if we do this last step of flipping this thing over and uh, so projecting out always recover and just looking at it from underneath. Okay, so here I've, uh, this, so these two, this plot and this plot, this is just, you know, taking this one, take each of these and looking at from looking at them from underneath. Um, Sorry, this one. This, this taking these two plots and looking at them from underneath, we then get these two pictures, and now we've got a more interesting story. We can see here that when we uh, combine the information from both of these observational studies, we end up with um, uh, bounds on our average causal effect, which now bound the average causal effect away from zero. Okay, so we can see here the smallest value of the average causal effect. Uh, corresponds to uh, to the points here, which gives us an average causal effect of 0.39. The largest corresponds to this line, which is average causal effect of 0.78. So here, we've now taken the information from this um, imperfect experiment where people didn't do what they asked, what were expected to do, but we've still been able to salvage things and we see that now there was uh, a, a, a non-zero average causal effect. The average causal effect was positive. Okay, so, so now you see that was why we bothered to go through and work out those polytopes this morning, because now when we take those two and intersect them, now we get some non-trivial information out. Okay, so there is, a, there is sometimes, sometimes when people see this, they sort of think, wait a second, hold on, you must have pulled a fast one on me because the data from each arm, each arm was an observational study, and uh, we, this morning we had this kind of good news, bad news story where we saw that when we get the information from an observational study, um, the bounds always contain zero and always have width one. So the data from each observational study is compatible with an average causal effect of zero. So how come when we combine the information from these two studies, we have ruled out the possibility of the average causal effect being zero? It seems it may initially strike you as a little bit of cognitive dissonance there. But if we go back and look, you can see what's actually going on here, which is, yes, the data from each arm is compatible with an average causal effect of zero. So average causal effect of zero corresponds to the, the sort of the plane going through here where helped and hurt are equal. And so we can see, yep, there's a little bit of this green plane that 
is compared with helped and hurt equal to zero. And there's a little bit of this uh, purple polytope that's uh, compatible with average causal effect is zero. But what we see is that uh, that those two, uh, the, the, the scenarios that are compatible with the average causal effect being zero under each, uh, uh, um, each of these sets are very different. Right? So under the Z equals zero arm, we have average causal effect is zero, but we're way down here in the bottom where we have very few people of type always recover and many people of type never recover. Whereas uh, when we are, um, uh, when, when we are uh, in the, looking at the data from the treatment arm, we have to have uh, many more people of type uh, always recover in order to have uh, the average causal effect, the proportion of helped and hurt um, uh, being equal. Okay. So, so essentially another way to say this, which may be perhaps easier to think about, is that if we, if, we, um, if we project and then take the intersection, then, so if we project down to these two dimensional shapes and then take the intersection, then yes, we will end up with uh, um, the, the, inter the intersections of projections will be larger than the projection of the intersections. So if we first intersect and then project, we end up with a smaller set. Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah, so one, one difficulty I'm having, and maybe this is the computer science trying to think in the worst case, but I guess the, you don't have zero inside here, but that's only for one particular example. Like I think I'm having trouble making sense of the geometry without seeing some uh, like the in inequalities written out, but I guess that like it could be the case that, you know, when you give everyone the drug, nobody decides to take it in which case i i would presume we're we're in a bad scenario there where we somehow can't rule out certain things so that's like there's no randomness there i suppose but could you highlight a little bit more about yes. you know it, i yes. guess the, so, the, the the confusion yeah. that i'm having yeah so certainly it is certainly the case that um <clears throat> i mean for example if it is the case that the two observational studies turn out to be exactly the same so, uh, so, you know, so somehow, um, I mean, yeah, we'll talk about this experiment, for example, with a very common experiment like this is an encouragement design where people are encouraged to, to, to take the treatment. So for example, educational interventions, where there's some random subset of people who are encouraged to go along and get optional tutoring, but maybe the, you know, there's another form, people are, uh, this is a real study where people are randomly assigned uh, to have their doctor encourage them to get a flu vaccine versus another group of people who didn't have that. Um, so yeah, so if it's the case that that encouragement has no effect at all on whether or not people uh, avail themselves of the treatment or avail themselves of the extra study, then of course, we're then back to the scenario where we've just got one observational study and we are going to contain zero. So there's no, there's, is that certainly the case that this is not guaranteed to be informative? And there will be many circumstances where these bounds will still contain zero. It's just what's what's nice here is that at least sometimes we are able to get informative bounds. There are also other things that can go wrong, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about them uh, um, in just a second. Okay. Is it uh, is it possible that these two polytopes actually don't intersect? Yes, that's that's what can go wrong. Yes, I will. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Yes, you're stealing my thunder, but I always think that's a good sign when people can see further ahead. Yes. So the bounds that we get here, what I've shown you, these are bounds that were originally derived by Borky and Pearl, um, and they obtained them from a different perspective, uh, where they um, they had they had types for both. Um, both the compliance behavior and the, the response, uh, and they use computational algebra. Um, and so the thing which is nice about this approach is it, it sort of allows us to see where those bounds are coming from. And we'll also see, it also generalizes to situations where there are more Z arms, but X and Y are still binary. Okay, so just to formalize this a little bit more, here's, our, our, um, here's the, the model that we've been talking about thinking about it, this is as, as a graph. Um, Z is what's uh, randomly assigned. Here's X and here's Y, we're allowing um, confounding. And we have sort of potential outcomes, which is 
uh, for X and Y. So the potential outcomes for X are, you know, whether or not you avail, whether a particular person avails themselves of, of treatment when they're assigned to treatment or control. And then Y is as it was before, it's how the person is responding to X. Um, again, I'm using that same shorthand. And uh, randomization assumption here, we're just supposing Z is, is independent of, because uh, it's randomized, it's independent of our potential outcomes. And we have what's called an exclusion assumption, which is we're supposing that the only way that Z influences Y is through X. Okay, so we're, uh, so sort of here, our potential outcomes with essentially, we could index the potential outcomes for Y by both X and Z, but we're supposing that the potential outcome for Y only depends on X. Okay, so that, that was what I was saying. We're assuming that, that the way that the person responds to placebo is not different uh, uh, depending on, you know, it, it's not different because they get this sort of adrenaline rush from, from disobeying authority when they're in the treatment arm. Okay, so we're supposing that's not the case. We're supposing the only way that Z influences Y is through X. Okay. Um, so these are the assumptions that we, we put into our model. So we, these are the types that we saw before relating X to Y, but in addition, we now have four other types relating Z to X. So we have the always takers, never takers, compliers and defiers. Okay, so a complier is someone who you know, does as they're told. The defier is a person who does exactly the opposite, sometimes called a, but there are a lot of defier three-year-olds out there um, in my experience. And then, um, you know, always taker is, is the person who's, who's always going to take and, and never take a, you know. So in, in the study that we were talking about before, um, if you're in the control arm, you had to get zero. So therefore, in that study, we're actually, we only had never takers and compliers. So we're no always takers or defiers. Okay, so we can come up with a two-way table, similar to the ones that we looked at this morning. Um, and, you know, so for example, just to talk our way through this, if we look at this entry here, so this is the person assigned to control, sure enough, they got control and they had a bad outcome. So that person is one of two things, they're either never taker and never recover, so, or never taker and helped. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, uh, um, or they could be complier and never recover, or they could be complier and helped. So the, the basic point is they had X equals zero and Y equals zero. So that means that we know they're of type never recover or helped. And they had Z equals zero and X equals zero. So we know they're of type never taker or complier. Um, if, if in addition, the same person, so the people that are in this cell here are people that have under control X equals zero and Y equals zero and under treatment, they have X equals zero and Y equals zero. So it doesn't matter what arm we assign them to, they uh, don't take treatment and their, um, and their outcome is, is zero in both cases. So then we know that they're a type never taker because they have X equals zero regardless of whether they're assigned to Z equals zero or Z equals one. But they could be, um, they could be ne of type never recover or helped. Okay. And so a way I sort of describe this is, the people that have typed never taker and never recover are just sad, right? It's, it's somebody who there was just no way that we could have helped them. It didn't matter whether they took the drug or not, they were going to have a, a, a bad outcome. But the, the sort of the people who are of type never taker and helped is tragic, right? Because these are people who, um, who it doesn't matter whether we ask them to take the drug or not, they won't take the drug. But uh, the tragedy is that if somehow we had managed to, uh, you know, convince them to take the drug, then they would have had a good outcome. Okay. Um, this, this entry here, this cell here is empty. And the reason for that is, can anyone think why there's a reason for that? Let me talk through what's going on here. So if someone were, if there were people in this cell, they would have, they would be people that would have, um, X equals zero, regardless of whether they were assigned to control or treatment, but they would have Y equals zero if they were, if, if they were um, assigned to control, but Y equals one if they were assigned to treatment. So this would mean now 
that somehow Z was having an effect on their final outcome, even though they have the same value of X in both arms. Okay? And so that would violate our assumption that Z only affects Y through X. Because somebody in here would be somebody who, when they, you know, doesn't matter which arm we put them in, they have X equals zero. Doesn't matter if we ask them to take treatment or not. So they're, they're of type never taker. But somehow, uh, yes, somehow when they're, when they're in the treatment arm, they're, again, their defiance of authority gives them this extra power and they have a good outcome. Whereas uh, up here, um, they don't get that adrenaline and they have, uh, they have a bad outcome when they, when they just are asked to take placebo and do take, take placebo. Okay, so the, that's why these entries are, why there's no one in here because under our assumptions, we've ruled out uh, uh, these possibilities. And that's gonna turn out to be very interesting in just a moment. Okay, so just to kind of do, say a, mo a couple of words about previous results. So Robbins and Mansky derived natural bounds on the average causal effect in this particular setting. Um, and these bounds are not sharp in general if there are defiers, they follow from weaker assumptions. They follow from just these two Meisner uh, independencies. Um, Bolke and Pearl derived the closed form expression for the ACE bounds uh, that are tight by a computational algebra. And those expressions are maximum, minimum over eight different expressions. But ultimately, they that's the same thing as the, uh, the calculation that I'm showing you by intersecting those two polytopes. And David uh, re-derived the bounds uh, without explicitly using potential outcomes, again, using computational algebra. So an advantage of the approach I've shown you here is that supposing I had more Z arms, I still have X and Y binary, but I have more Z arms, then I can extend the analysis. I just take the intersection of more polytopes. So it, it generalizes to arbitrarily many um, Z arms. Uh, and yeah, so essentially this is just saying that, I think maybe this was even a question that was asked in the audience. So, you know, here, these are the same bounds that I showed you uh, this morning for the observational study, but here we're just taking, we're taking the minima and maxima over all of the different uh, Z observational studies. So yeah, this, real, this is really saying nothing other than construct a polytope for every one of those of your Z arms, every one of your observational studies, and then take their intersection. And then if you then finally ask about the average causal effect, then you, know, then you can work out uh, the bounds on the average causal effect and they, they turn out to take this form. And this exploits the fact, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this, but this exploits the fact that, um, that uh, the, the margins here um, are variation independent. We can come back to that if people are, are interested at the end. Okay, on to a point that was raised earlier, which is, couldn't this happen? Could it be the case that the two, um, that the two polytopes don't intersect? Yes, it could, that's entirely possible. Um, and uh, it turns out that the, the situations when the polytopes don't intersect corresponds exactly to the circumstance when, uh, uh, corresponds to the situation where these bounds on the margin that we have, the upper bound could be less than the lower bound. Um, and I'll give you a bit of intuition for that in just a moment. But so in the simple case where we've got, going back to Z being binary, we end up with these four inequalities. Okay, so these four inequalities define <laughs> the observed model in the, uh, in the binary case. And so a thing I want to sort of say here is that, um, you know, in the talk yesterday, um, and, and I guess also on, on Tuesday, there was a lot of focus on causal models giving rise to conditional independence restrictions. But um, here, the interesting thing is here we have some inequalities and those inequalities actually turn out to be useful and interesting. So, I mean, if, if we go back, tying this back to what we talked about before uh, on, on Monday and Tuesday, if I show you this graph here, right, then H is unobserved, you should 
if you were sort of took in D separation, you'll see there are no D separation relations that hold here, right? Because the only place where we could potentially have a D separation is between Z and Y. The Z and Y are obviously deconnected given the empty set, and they're also deconnected conditional on X by this pathway. So we have no D separations, but we still do have these um, inequality restrictions. Let me give you a little bit of interest about these. So let's take, an, take this example. This is saying that uh, under this model, this probability, y equals zero and x equals zero given z equals zero, plus this probability, y equals one and x equals zero given z equals one, better be less than or equal to, um, uh, less than or equal to one. So let's have a look here and see why that, uh, why that has to be. So this is saying that when I add up this number plus this number, those two better not add up to um, better not add up to more than um, one. And you can see why that has to be the case. Supposing I tell you that this this you know this number here is eighty percent and this number here is seventy percent, then you'll say, okay, so this number is eighty percent. So that means these four types are 80% of the population. And then these four types are 70% of the population. So that means we've got 150% of the population is corresponds to these eight types. So, so essentially the issue is that because the set of types that we have here and the set of types that we have here have no intersection, therefore um, they cannot add up to more than 100%. So the reason we've got four inequalities is because we've got these four empty cells. Thomas, question in the Zoom. Why wouldn't matching with propensity scores or something like that be a more natural approach to solving these types of problems? Well, I mean, I guess the, the issue is, um, so the, 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 I guess coming back to this, you know, that depends on whether or not you believe that you really have no enough. So the propensity score approach would be if I've got lots of data, if I've got lots and lots of data, maybe I've got enough data that conditional on that data, um, uh, you know, I, I don't need the instrument. I can just view this as an observational study and I've got enough data that uh, <coughs> conditional on those covariates is something we'll talk about this, uh, this, tomorrow, uh, this afternoon, but like the backdoor formula that sort of X is as if assigned at random conditional on those covariates. Yes, uh, if, you, if you really believe that, then um, that, would, that, then that would be another way to analyze this. Uh, and indeed, you know, Certainly, there's a lot of interest in triangulating things. So, um, for example, combining information from an observational analysis and maybe some analysis where we have an instrument. I think the real power here comes from the fact that, uh, you know, in settings like, um, you know, encouragement designs, you know, if we do have an instrument, and by so this is a thing I, I, I want to stress, which is that. I think the reason why graphical models are not used more frequently for causal analyses is because every graphical model starts off by requiring you to know something about the structure typically in order for the analysis to go through. Yes, there are learning algorithms, but it's, it's, it's you know, not that common that a learning algorithm gives you just one structure back. Um, and so, so in typical ca cases, the, the researcher is being required to make a guess as to what the right causal st structure is. And, if, and everything that follows from there depends on that guess being right. Here, yes, okay, there is some information that we're using here. We're having to, we're having to suppose that our instrument affects X and doesn't directly affect Y except through X. But, but those things can be, we can set up designs that make that like, okay, so if we do a double blind randomized experiment, then that gives us some reason to think that Z cannot be affecting Y except through X. And the fact we've randomized Z means that we know that there aren't other edges into Z here. Okay, so, so essentially turning this around, if I was wanting to sort of, uh, you know, I, I, I think these methods, I think adjusting for, background variables using the backdoor formula, those methods complement this kind of analysis. But I will say 
what this analysis has going for it is that if this bounds the average causal effect away from zero, then the assumptions the assumptions that the analysis rests on are assumptions that you could uh, make hold by design. Whereas you know, any propensity score analysis is going to depend on choosing the right covariates, specifying the model, you know, you're up against the potentially up against the curse of dimensionality there, you know, it's a lot of a lot of um, you will be relying on many more assumptions, typically. Okay. Yes. Uh, um, could you go back to your two-way table? Yep. So, in order to um, give a bound on ACE, you uh, computed these two polytopes, intersected them, and then you got the, the bounds. Yep. So, looking at this table. I think you can do it more directly, right? So I see here um, a polytope as a, as a pre-image of a map from 15-dimensional simplex to eight dimen seven-dimensional simplex. Right? As you have the, the variables, you know, P, N, T, comma, N, R, et cetera, there are 16 of them. Um, and then you have the, the marginals, there are eight of them. So that's going to give you a polytope. And then you can, give, you can get a, a, a linear map that's going to project to the you know, probability of H, E, and A, R, and whatnot. So you're going to get another polytope that way. So can you not do that to compute the, the bounds on ACE instead of- Yes, yes. You, you certainly could do that. And that's how Pearl did it originally. He did it okay. <laughs> exactly in the way that was as done here. If you look in his book, that's how he, he went ahead and did it. But, it. but there is a downside to that, which is that as, as the number of levels of Z increases, yeah. And the number of, uh, of types that you'll have for the X is growing quickly. And so people have not, uh, so, so the advantage of doing the, presenting it in the way that I've done is that essentially it, it divides up the analysis. Um, so yeah, so if, if, I think basically people hadn't done it, you know, if you try to do this where Z takes three levels or four levels or K right. levels, then computationally this, um, at least, in my understanding, I think in terms of the uh, the, the, the analysis, uh, um, the dimension of the analysis explodes. Whereas, you know, by doing it this way that I presented to you, um, you we can visualize everything that's that, that, that's going ahead, and we can do arbitrarily many levels of Z uh, without having to. Um, yeah, so that that's basically with, with uh, purely by thinking about one arm at a time. Right. I mean, just I mean, maybe follow up questions that do you know how they compare in terms of bounds you get, at least in, in situations you can compute? They're, they're, they're identical. They're it's identical. The right? Yeah. Oh. So oh. The, the, the bounds are the same. That's what I said here. I said, I said, uh, I said, I don't know. I said, I said earlier that Pearl got the, I said the bounds that he got, okay. he got by doing principal structure. So, but, but Pearl only gave them for Z taking two levels. One more question. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, could you go back to the diagon instrumental variables? Yep. I just wanted to make a comment, actually, uh, not, not so much a question about the uh, discussion on propensity score methods, which is that um, uh, it's related to what Thomas was saying, which is that with instrumental variables, right, you don't need to observe H. Right? You don't, it can be an unobserved. Correct. Founder, but yep. any propensity score methods you need to observe, you need to have measurements on all of the relevant confounders for the causal effect you want to identify. So it's a pretty big advantage of um, instrumental variables, I think, just that you don't need to have observed, which is basically what Thomas was saying. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, but I mean, it, it does have to be said that, you know, we're not, what I'm presenting is giving bounds. Okay. So now, now, hopefully, you see where all these inequalities come from. Um, and so these were also introduced by Pearl and generalized by Bonnet, um, and then further generalized on, uh, by uh, Kedany and uh, Morifier. I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. And these provide a falsification test of the binary IV model. So basically, if you violate these inequalities, then we know that the, uh, the, the, the IV model does not hold 
Um, but um, and, and at least in this simple case, uh, um, it corresponds, if you violate these inequalities, a way of thinking about this is that you're actually able to work out that um, if, we, if we continue to maintain the assumption that Z was randomized, so you know, we believe that Z was randomized, then essentially, if we're violating one of these inequalities, what, we'd, what we're able to do is we're able to work out that Z does have an effect, direct effect on Y um, uh, holding X fixed, which, which you can sort of see from the fact that what, what are we doing when we violate one of these inequalities, we're working out that one of these entries here is greater than zero. So we're working out that there, there must be some people who even though they get have would have the same level of X, regardless of which level of Z they uh, got, their, their Y would change. Okay. Uh, so these are the inequalities. Um, so that's what I'm saying here. It can be interpreted as bounding away this guy away from zero. The average direct effect of Z on Y holding X fixed at X. Um, this, this set is not so easy to, uh, to visualize, um, but we can, we can at least think of it sort of three-dimensional shadow, three-dimensional projection. So if we take the left-hand sides of these inequalities, we could define new variables corresponding to each one of the left-hand sides. And then obviously, because we've got two We've got all of the possible values for y and x when z is zero and all possible values when z is one. If we add up all of these guys, it's gonna sum up to two. So therefore these, these quantities here have to live in the, two, the simplex of, of uh, points that add up to two. And then these inequalities here then cut out this little octahedron inside the, this. So this is, this is letting us see the projection of the, the, so the, 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 the IV model is a set of distributions over y and x given z equals zero and y and x given z equals one. So formally that lives in a six dimensional space. It's not, you know, it's not super easy to visualize what that is, but here I'm showing you what the projection is when we project from that six dimensional space down to the three dimensional space, which lets us see that, um, which lets us also see that uh, that we have um, uh, that each one of these inequalities is um, uh, uh, that at most one of these inequalities could be uh, um, violated. So uh, Ismail is asking a question, saying, uh, um, "Yeah." So Ismail is asking, "Is it not the case that we could get the Pell inequalities under weaker assumptions?" And that is indeed uh, the case. Um, yeah. We, it, it, so I'm. I'm not claiming the conditions I'm giving here are the weakest possible conditions to derive the, uh, the Pearl's inequalities. Um, but yeah, uh, so the, this, the claim, I wasn't saying that the independence, the potential outcome independences were, um, were uh, necessary to get these bounds on the ACEs, merely that they are um, sufficient and indeed you can derive uh, these inequalities even without um, without having potential outcomes over X uh, if you're willing to assume that there's a latent, for example. Okay, so these are some uh, uh, some related works, um, and so this is sort of moving more in the statistical direction. So up to this point, I've just treated it as if we have huge sample sizes and we know what these uh, distributions are. So we're really just thinking about identification. But of course, in reality, we don't have huge sample sizes, um, uh, and we need to think about the fact that uh, that, that there's there's uh, statistical noise in the in our counts. So Lauritsen and Ramsahai biometrical paper provide an approach for for testing these restrictions restrictions that we've got here. And so it's not as simple as just plugging in the uh, plugging in the empirical distribution here, because even if the model's true, we might just by chance violate one of these uh, inequalities. So Lawrence and Rams are high provided a, a, um, a, a, a approach via a likelihood procedure combined with the bootstrap. Um, I have a paper with <coughs> um, Limbo Wang and Jamie Robbins that tests this, allows you to test these in the presence of, uh, in the model where we have baseline covariance. So that's like a, a model where um, we have, where we have the usual IV model, but in addition, there might be some 
baseline uh, covariates that everything is conditioned on that this model holds on. So there's like a V that's a parent of of uh, um, uh, of uh, Z, X, and Y. Uh, and but then there's been more work since then, um, and so uh, Kidani and Morifier uh, showed got additional constraints. So Bonnet got constraints that uh, arose when there were three arms. Kidani and Morifier gave all of the constraints, and they also provided a testing procedure, statistical testing procedure using a sample splitting procedure of uh, Chernyshukov et al. Okay, so I've got a few minutes. As I predicted, I was going to run out of time. I'm going to tell you very quickly tell you about two approaches to Bayesian inference, one that's naive and one that's not naive. And then I will give you basically probably uh, about 10 seconds to say that there are other frequentist approaches. Um, OK, so up to this point, we just ignored sampling variability. We, I've just taken the data and essentially we just, um, uh, you know, if, if we had had time, I, we could have generated these polytopes using the empirical frequencies and intersected them. In fact, that's what I did. I, yeah, I, I generated those polytopes using empirical frequencies. But of course, we don't really know. We don't get to see uh, this distribution exactly. So one way to take care of sampling variability is a way that Pearl explicitly advocated in his, uh, in his uh, 2000 book. This is, in some sense, the sort of the one part that is statistical, where he's taking into account sampling variability. He says, let's just put a Dirichlet prior on this on, on our uh, types, this uh, 16 di different types. Um, and then we could use MCMC to sample from the posterior distribution given our observed data. So let's see what happens with this in the case of the lipid data. So here, these are the mycel prior distributions. So recall that in that lipid example, the cholestyramine example, um, there are only two compliance types, complier and never taker, because if you're in the control arm, you weren't going to get the treatment. So the only two compliance types were complier and never taker. We've got our four response types, always recover, help, hurt, never recover. So we've got eight types that we have to worry about in this setting. Uh, and so this is, this is the mycel prior distribution that you get. Here I just put down uniform uh, on, this, uh, on the simplex. And then these are the posterior distributions. Okay, so these are mycel prior and posterior distributions. Right? This, this is actually a distribution that's living in a, in a seven dimensional space, but I'm showing you the mycels. Okay, so here, this is now showing you, we're looking at the average causal effect from the lipid data. And, you know, it lives on minus one to one. The green curve here is the prior distribution before we see any data. The red curve here is the posterior. And these dotted lines here are the upper and lower bounds that we would get out from just plugging in the empirical distribution into Pearl's bounds. Okay, so far so good, but then Suppose that we perturb this prior a tiny bit. So uh, I'll zoom this a little bit. Okay, so here I'm perturbing it. So instead of it being Dirichlet 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, it's now we've changed it to be Dirichlet 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1.2, 1, 0 0.8. So I'm making a very little change to this Dirichlet uh, uh, prior. So you can see here on the prior, right? This is before we see any data. I think you're slightly more likely to be never taker and help, slightly less likely to be never taker and never recover. But then when we see our data, and remember the data that we had here, the smallest count was about 12 or 13. There's still a big difference. We've got a big difference in the posterior. Okay, so this was the posterior before. This is the posterior after. I make this tiny perturb to the prior. So I make a tiny change to the prior. And if you've seen Bayesian inference before, maybe you haven't, but if you've seen Bayesian inference before, in typical problems that are properly identified, a tiny change to a prior like this would not precipitate such a big change to posterior when you've got reasonable sample sizes, which, you know, here we don't have huge sample sizes, but we don't have, you know, the smallest count was, was 12 or 13. And this is what happens to the average causal effect. Okay, so here you can see the dotted curves show the prior and posterior after we make the tiny perturbation to the prior. Okay, so you can see here, maybe you don't get too excited about this, but I mean, you can see the posterior has changed, right? The posterior previously looked like this. Now I make this little change to the prior, you can see we've got this dotted thing. And if you look at the median here, here I'm showing you the median, it's moved. And the interesting thing here is that the median of the posterior has moved more than the median of the prior. 
So when I first presented this to Bayesian colleagues, these are Bayesian colleagues not working causal inference, they said, oh, well, you know, this is to do with your prior is not diffuse enough, right? You should have a more diffuse prior because here, look, the support of the posterior, you know, there's conflict between the prior and the posterior. The data and the prior are having a sort of not happy with one another. You should have a more diffuse prior and this problem will go away. So we could try unit information prior. So here, instead of it being one, 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 I put one eighth, one eighth, one eighth, one eighth. So this is a di more diffuse prior and I'm also doing a perturbation. And now you can see what happens. We get kind of the doctor's use posterior. Okay, so essentially uh, the, the one eighth, one eighth, one eighth, one eighth uh, prior gives us this sort of peaked um, bimodal distribution. And then when I make this little perturbation, which is actually smaller than the one I made before. So I just move one sixteenth from here to here. We get this, you know, huge shift. We've got a huge shift. Okay, so what is this meaning? It means that essentially, you know, this is the kind of Bayesian model your parents warned you about. Okay, so what's happening here is that, you know, if I'm a Bayesian and I have this prior, and you know, I'm making a decision, I have this prior, I compute my posterior, I make a decision, great, there's no problem. But usually Bayesians, when they do analysis, they want to show them to other people who might have slightly different priors. And what this shows us that it, is that taking this naive approach of just putting a prior over all of these types and then proceeding ahead with the analysis, the results are then very sensitive to changes in the prior. So if somebody presents you an analysis like this, the question you should ask yourself is, you know, well, that's great. I, I'm happy for you that you know what your posterior is, but why are you, why are you telling me about it? Because if my prior is slightly different, then surely, um, th 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 then, you know, my posterior might be very different to yours. That's a sign telling me that I've, I, I'm over time. Okay, so let me just say very briefly, we can get it, we can come up with an alternative way to, to deal with this uh, problem by basically just formulating the model via these inequalities. So what we can do is we can formulate our model directly as a model on the observed distribution, okay? Because the observed distribution is identified under the model. And so essentially we re-parameterize. So instead of parameterizing in terms of those 16 types, we re-parameterize in terms of the observed distribution, which is identified. And a parameter here that I'm, I'm calling Aleph, because this is a parameter that's completely uh, non-identifiable. So essentially uh, that um, uh, if, if we start off with independent priors between these two things, then however much data we have, our, uh, our beliefs about this are not going to be changed by the data that we see. So essentially a way of saying this is, whatever you believe about this, you better be comfortable with it because it doesn't matter how much data you see, you're going to continue to have the same beliefs. And so in, in particular, just to be concrete about what this is, this is something like the ratio of these two types. Okay, so it doesn't matter how much data I see, it doesn't matter how much data I see, I'm not going to be able to learn about the, uh, as, uh, un unless I do a different experiment where I somehow force people to get X equals zero or X equals one, as long as I'm just doing an experiment like this, I'm never going to be able to learn anything about the ratio of these two joint types, never take or never recover, never take or help, because <clears throat> they always show up together in the likelihood. So, yeah, so this is to say, essentially, um, to do a bit proper Bayes analysis uh, where you're not, um, you can reparameterize, then this part of the, the, these parameters are identified, these parameters are completely not identified. And so you can then, you know, you can then either compute a posterior distributions on the bounds, which is what I'm showing you here. I'm showing you posteriors on the bounds and I'm perturbing the, the prior and you can see there's no change at all. Or if you want to know about the average causal effect, then uh, you can make the posterior on the average causal effect a function of a sensitivity parameter. So this is a quantity that you can't ever learn about. It's about the proportion of never takers who would recover if we somehow forced them to get treatment. And so we can do a Bayesian sensitivity analysis. And unfortunately, that's it. I'm going to have to uh, stop there, but there's lots of lots of interesting related work, and there are great people at uh, at the Science Institute who, at the moment, who can tell you about it. So I will stop there.
Oh, so, so, thank you. There was one question going back to the instrumental variable uh, discussion that we had earlier, from, that I missed this time, uh, from Andrea, where she says, I believe you mentioned earlier that weak instruments were not a problem, that aren't weak instruments complicating the inference about the bound? No. No, they're not, uh, not going to, all that's going to happen is that the bounds will be uninformative. I mean, the bounds will contain zero, but the uh, inference here, <coughs> um, both methods, so I don't, didn't have time to get into it, but basically uh, we can also do, um, there's a method um, that, uh, a method that came up, uh, um, developed with uh, Richard that is based on coming up with, uh, a Compton's region or the Bayesian approach, both of those methods, the only issue which is going to arise is that the, um, that the bounds will be uninformative. So, so that's, yeah, it's not going to, um, the inference is going to be fine. The inference will go Thomas, through. in the limit, uh, you, you, you make E independent of X. It's like you have two populations where you basically have two observational studies. I mean, you have two replicates of the population. You, you take two samples, right? And that's why in the limit, basically you don't have information. You basically get two polytops that eventually converge to the same place. Yeah. You have an intersection. Is that right? Is that yeah. how? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, basically, yes, exactly. I mean, what's going to happen is, I mean, you, you'll get, your posterior is going to end up um, being where, you know, it's quite correct that we're not going to get informative inferences. Absolutely right. agree with that. But it's but it, there's nothing going to go wrong with the statistics. Right, right. I understand that. I understand that. that. I understand that. Yeah. Ismail has a question. So thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I have a quick question about the inference procedure when you are using the Bayesian method. Yeah. And this is going back to, to my question about when you, you impose the assumption on the potential treatment, right? Because, the, for example, to get the average treatment effect is not clear to me that you really need to impose any independence assumption on the potential treatment, right? And uh, what you call X, X of Z. Yeah. In that case, in your Bayesian approach, you have to define this prior for the whole dimension. So if Z has a multiple value, you have to define the posterior of X over X of Z and also Y of Z, right? As a way that you define here, uh, and yeah. Y of X. Okay, okay. So, so just to be clear, there are two Bayesian approaches I was presenting. One, which is the one that Pearl described, which mm -hmm. I was critiquing. I may not have made that clear enough. I was critiquing that approach. Exactly. That was approach where we put a joint distribution over X of Z and Y of X. So I was critiquing that approach. And what I'm arguing is instead not doing that. I'm instead arguing for a different approach where we just put the posterior distribution directly over the observable model. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm advocating an approach where we go directly for inference about the observed distribution we learn about the observed distribution. And then I completely agree with you. We could get the bounds without having to talk about the uh, potential outcomes for X. Absolutely agree with you. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't been emphasizing this at this point here because I'm trying to get people to sort of understand potential outcomes. And so I was you know, doing it with X potential outcomes and Y potential outcomes. But you're absolutely right that we could do this the same analysis without that. So when you, you get, you put this, this posterior on the observed distribution, you are basically getting like, uh, you dominate the procedure that was proposed by Pearl before in terms of like good fit and everything in general? Uh, I, I mean, they, they're answering different questions, okay? Essentially that the, so, um, so the first thing I'm doing is I'm doing inference for the observed distribution. Uh, uh, right, the observed distribution is const constrained by those inequalities, and I'm doing inference for that distribution. That's the first task. Okay. Uh, and then the second thing, then there are different things we could do. One thing we could do is we could say, well, we could we could work out. So in general, working out the set of unidentified parameters in the in the simple case that we were doing, where there were just never takers and compliers, it's quite easy to describe. There's really only one parameter, extra parameter that one needs which is this thing I called here, that's the proportion of never takers who would recover if they go X equals one. Mm -hmm. In the general case where you've got defiers and compliers and always takers and never takers, it's a more complicated story that you need sort of three sensitivity parameters and they don't have quite such a simple interpretation. 
but in principle, the same analysis can be. And I, yeah, I have a Valencia paper with um, Jamie and and Robin where we where where, where we went through and uh, and did that. Um, uh, but yeah, and then basically there are two options you could do. One option is you just say, you know, I just want I want to be like the frequentist. I just want to compute posteriors on my bounds, right? Uh, the other thing you could do, but uh, is you could say, well. No, but hold on a second. We actually have to make a decision here. Come on, guys. We need to make a decision. And if that's the case, then then I think the thing, you know, then then somebody at some point has to kind of decide. I'm the guy that's deciding. These are my priors. I'm now going to now sort of feed those priors in on 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 you know this stuff that we can't learn about. I'm going to be very brave. I'm going to put my priors down on that. Make a decision. Use my utility function. And we're going to do something, but the but the one point is at least in terms of presenting my analysis to people. This is sort of like Lima, I think, has uh, Lima Ed Lima has this distinction between what he calls private analyses and public analyses, and sort of so private analyses are like what I was describing. I'm the Bayesian. I know my prior. I'm going to compute my posterior, and I'm going to make a decision on what we're going to do. But to other people. I don't see whether they should necessarily be very interested in, in, in what that posterior is, because if their post prior is a tiny bit different than their posterior. And so partly I was provoked in, in, in wanting to look at this because there was a talk that Don Rubin gave where he was analyzing the same model, but a much, in fairness, a much more complicated version where X was continuous, where, where, where compliance was continuous. And he did this analysis and, and uh, one of my colleagues said, well, this is very nice, but you know, this model is clearly not non-parametrically identified. So uh, your analysis, the fact you're getting these results out, either they're being driven by your prior or they're being driven by some parametric assumptions you're making, which one is it? And I mean, it was, you know, his response was to say, well, you know, Bayesians don't really care about identifiability. And at that point I sort of felt like, oh really? They don't care about identifiability. So this is basically to make the point that, well, you know, yes, it's true. If I'm just computing a posterior and it's for my personal consumption and I'm going to make the decision and nobody else is looking at it, then yes, we don't need to worry about identifiability. But if, uh, if, anyone, if, if I'm telling anybody else about my posterior, then probably they want to know how much of it was informed by the data and how much of it was this stuff that the data told us absolutely nothing about. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, thank you. I don't see any more questions in the room or on Zoom. So thank you very, very much, Thomas. We'll take a two-hour break and then reconvene at two o'clock. Thank you.